You're listening to Force Majeure, an actual play podcast that's usually Star Wars, but today we're doing something a little bit different. And you'll find out what that is after this vital briefing from Terran Command. Attention, Fireteam Sabre Harmony. This is Marshal Eustabal Singh, briefing you on Operation August Kobold. Thanks to your efforts, not only have we managed to push the Aeonic Primacy back out of this system, but we've also managed to seize a number of supplies, and, more pertinently, information. As our scavengers were going through the staging post to see what was salvageable, we came across a computer core that had escaped destruction from the bombardment, internal sabotage or remote deletion. Our techies were able to recover it intact, and while your mechs have been being upgraded and repaired, our analysts have been sifting through the intel. Among the intelligence recovered is a reference to a military R&D base in this system, built into one of the asteroid moons orbiting Balamar 8. From what our analysts can uncover, this facility was only lightly guarded so as not to draw attention. We've only been able to crack some of the encryption around what the facility were researching, but this certainly is suggested of upgraded combat algorithms for Mecha which we should be able to adapt, if you can get it. While this won't be your usual sort of mission, we expect minimal resistance, it is nevertheless a vital one. It will also give us an opportunity to try out our new exosuit prototypes to assess them for combat readiness. These are mid-range power armour, one size up from your pilot carapaces, but one down from your full mecha. While not as devastating in open combat as your full mecha, they should strike a medium between manoeuvrability and potency, especially as we believe the facility will be too small for your actual mecha. We currently have a brief window of time before the Primacy realises we've uncovered the facility's coordinates and removes it from play, so we're loading up the slip ship now. You have a few hours while we install the modified IFF and plot the course. Valkyrie will again be your tactics and control in the field, and we'll be providing real-time monitoring of Primacy presence. Good luck, fire team. Marshal Singh, out. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Force Majeure Does the Mecha Hack! Mission 2, Operation August Kobold. The, the namings are all relevant, but you probably won't understand why. They work, make sense to me. Deal with it. Um, my name is Adam, and we once again running this phenomenally fun game. And to run a phenomenally fun game, I need some phenomenally fun players. Unfortunately, I have some of the finest. And I would like you to introduce yourselves to our listeners and tell them who you're playing now, please. Hi, I'm Riley. He, him. I'm playing Lucas. He, him. My call sign is Carbon Rex, because I'm an edgy teenager. <laughs> I'm Sammy, pronouns are she, they, and I'm playing Faye, pronouns are they, them, and their call sign is Barricade. I am ACJ. I'll be playing Aerolide Void and Nox. I am Blamed Cat on the forums. I am playing Rook, and um, my call sign is Iron Decimus. We open in space, an asteroid field around the barren exoplanet of Balamar 8 in the Balamar system. I was going to say not a million miles, but we're talking space here, so it probably is a million miles away from where our last adventure took place. Our stalwart pilots and their mecha have had a little bit of downtime on their capital ship, have had their briefing, as you have heard, and are now exiting slipship space which is how we do hyperspace in the mecha hack, because I like the phraseology of it, into this asteroid field. There are many small asteroids and meteors in this area. It's not quite a full-blown asteroid field, but there is enough... Celestial debris, yeah. That's the word, celestial debris, that means that your ship is having to navigate in quite carefully. About 10 to 15 minutes after dropping back into real space your vessel comes to the R&D satellite you're looking for. You are all in, effectively, the cargo bay of the the slip ship. It is quite a small vessel, partly because really big vessels struggle to enter slip space, and also because they know that you're not going to need your full-blown mecha, so they don't need to provision you with anything bigger than you have. You're also here to acquire information rather than full-blown materiel, so it's not like they're expecting you to come back out carrying crates and crates of things. There's a little bit of space if you want to go looting. You know, I'm not going to take that away from you. I know what players are like, but that is not your primary objective. The lights in here are dim, a kind of bluish light rather than, uh, you know, like a a red mission go-go-go light or a dull yellow sun lamp. It's kind of a light bluish light. 
And yeah, your exosuits are currently buckled in. I imagine that you're all in your exosuits, being ready to deploy at a moment's notice. And this is the first time we will have seen them. We are familiar with what your characters look like, and we are familiar with what your full-blown mecha look like. And if you're not familiar with that, go back and listen to episodes 1 and indeed 2 of the previous arc. What do your exosuits look like as our camera pans around the loading bay ready for you to start play? Obviously these are, at least in Rook's case, he's finally been bit by the, ah, the Terrans are trying to make something for you that might make you feel better about your home but isn't your home kind of design. So instead of the Neon uh, Dominion that he's used to the design wise this is very terran de- design and the the funny part that was coming to my head was it's kind of like minecraft so it's very blocky and it's black and he's grumping about it so it looks like a blocky knightish type design because his other one you know just the way he had with the shield and and the uh, the warhammer and stuff like that still kind of there but overall it's kind of like a black blocky knight type thing and yeah he's not happy about it it's not green and gold like normal and and more ornate or anything like that so yeah that's that's what his looks like nox lovingly calls the uh the suit uh mini void and basically because they're having to upgrade aerolide void right now they've taken a lot of his armor off and that armor is you know pretty piecemeal because it's basically all giant cat machines so now we've taken those kind of trimmed them down and now i'm basically going to be piloting a uh power loader from aliens but with hands and treads for feet and uh it's slightly bigger than everyone's because i'm still the same kind of class and it's still bright yellow and nox loves it because she feels like she's punching things when she actually punches things (laughs) pleasing haptic feedback Mm -hmm. crunch much like rook faye was trying to capture a little piece of home with their exosuit. They worked with the Terran mechs to try to replicate an Aeonic style, and it looks baffling. It's a mishmash of straight lines and swooping curves, and it's not so much an exosuit as it is an exoskeleton. It's basically armor plates bolted directly onto their chassis, because if you listen to episode one, you would know that they are more robot than anything else. So it's basically just armor plates bolted directly onto them with a big reactor backpack and uh, pipes and hoses going everywhere, giving it uh, the effect of looking like the old cartoon Bane from Batman. I kind of get the feeling that it's not going to be a big enough reactor backpack. (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry, we'll reduce the size of the reactor. It's fine. (laughs) With my dice? Yeah. (laughs) Lucas is mounted on what they like to call Razor Jr. or RJ. Nobody's exactly sure where RJ came from. Lucas especially, because RJ has existed for longer than Lucas has been part of this team. But the way it works is it's basically a miniature razor with a little papoose on the front. It's an armored papoose, and Lucas is contained within the the armored papoose. (laughs) Like a baby Bjorn. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely love it. I'm 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 not gonna get used to that, Lucas. I'm sorry. I, I still just it's it's a papoose. It's my hands are free. <laughs> well, yeah. I can still hack. Oh, uh, okay. This is this is the way this 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 relationship works. I hack razor fights. That is true. Yes, that that's the way that works. Yes. Should I be on the back instead? <laughs> I mean, at least a back. Well, unless something's shooting you from the back. I mean, the one wouldn't be bad. You could I'm just as armored as I am in the big one. <laughs> it's a very armored papoose. But, it, but it's a papoose. What would you rather me do? Be inside it? <laughs> I, no, 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 no. Body horror is bad. No, let's not do that. No, no. <laughs> exactly. No, 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 no. Fine, it's fine. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're, you're right. Okay. <laughs> I'm just here, man. <laughs> just one of these missions, though. I'd like to be in first class and not in the cargo bay. That would be nice. If that happens, then you know something's wrong. Or we've done a lot of right. Yeah. Mm, Okay, I guess so. So maybe on the way back. (laughs) Okay, yeah, there we go. I like that. You'd think you'd be used to this kind of my little papoose here since uh, whatever her name was did it too. Yeah, I mean, she kind of made it funny. This isn't 
I mean, this is funny, but it's it's still it's just something you don't ever get used to. I don't get used to this this black blocky thing. <sighs> well, you could get it upgraded. But it's still it's not the same. It's it's not the same. It's it'll be fine. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. I've only been complaining about this for the last hour. It's fine. <sighs> The lights in the loading bay change uh, from a light blue to kind of the, the dull red of mission readiness, and Valkyrie crackles in over your comms. Okay, fire team, we are about to approach. There is more debris out here than we expected. Looks a little bit like the external airlocks have blown. If you're going to be getting into the base properly, you'll need to try and find a way to close them from the inside, otherwise you're going to vent the entire base, and that's probably not going to work out well. We are getting to the safest deployment zone we can for you, but you might need to use your manoeuvring jets just to get to the base entrance. Brace yourself. Doors will be opening in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. There is a hiss as the loading bay doors open, there is the venting of the air from within the cargo bay. Everything is kind of buckled down in here. And you get to see, for the first time with your own eyes, or the sensor suite anyway, your destination. This is a fairly sizable, rocky asteroid. It looks like at some point it has been used for mining purposes. You can still see the scars on the outside of it from when like old drilling derricks were attached at one point that have since been removed, presumably to lower its external profile. The main feature on this is a large set of metal doors burrowed a little bit into the face of the rock. So again, if you're coming at it from some angles, it will be hidden by, you know, the actual outcropping of the rock themselves. Those doors are open. Inside, from where you're looking, is pitch black. There is no lights currently on in there. The lights of your slip ship are, because they've pointed in that direction, are illuminating a bit further into the chasm. You can see the lights reflecting off what looks like another set of doors deeper into the, the cave itself. But at the moment, as I say, it is dark in there. There's no internal lights open, and these doors are open quite wide. That's concerning. The debris that surround it, there are crates that are kind of, have seemingly been expelled as the airlock's been open, bounced off some of the other rocks and then found a new orbit, or, or at least a new traverse around here, kind of caught in the, the wider orbit of the asteroid field. There are bits of what look like kind of tools and fixtures and fittings that appear to have been vented at the same time. And you're pretty sure just disappearing behind one of the smaller rocks. It looks like a person slowly floating. Anyone else get the feeling this is a trap? Oh, absolutely. 100% it's a trap. Well, as long as we're all ready. Nox just kicks off and starts piloting towards the doors. Keep an eye out for things that shouldn't be moving. Let's go. At the risk of burning through my reactor right away. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is what you did last time. It's the only way to start off the match. You know? I mean, it's go for it. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a race, obviously. I can't let Nox win. <laughs> oh, of course. No, no, no. You definitely can't. No. So, I'm going to booster sprint, move twice with a single move action, while your reactor die. Is it a one or a two that the reactor dice goes down? Uh, both. For you, Damn. both. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sets the tone. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. The point is, I won. Yeah. So, is it do like the old cars where, like, you know, you rev it up and then suddenly it does a little backfire? Yep, but we're in space, and the way physics works, the backfire makes you go a little bit faster. <laughs> so inside, it feels like it's worked. But <laughs> <laughs> you see red lights popping out everywhere. Nox watches you zip past her, and she's like, you're, you're core. Okay. <laughs> Deficient Terran engineering. <laughs> So my my mobility is trash, but I'm gonna like not try to keep up per se, but to try to shadow them as they go forward, and dip and dodge on the. Uh, oh sweet! I rolled a four on an eight for mobility. Nice. Yeah, goal is to stay keeping up and keeping watch. Everyone but Sammy, since Sammy has has burned her reactor to get there. I would like a mobility test with this system. You roll a d20 under 
because you're in your exosuits, your exosuits are a blend of your mecha and your on foot. So you have access to all of your mecha modules, but also all of your on foot skills. I don't think acrobatics probably counts for this, but if you have it, I'm prepared to hear a hustle for why you should get the bonus for having acrobatics. If you have an on foot skill, your your stat counts as being too higher. I got a five. I'm good. I rolled a 15. Oh, no. Oh, dear. My mobility is nine. Razor is not a machine, and so possibly does not have as efficient boosters as everybody else. I kind of imagine, because, because yeah, like RJ doesn't have the same maneuvering jets, I almost see them as leaping from, like, rock to rock to rock to get there. Yeah, mm. that could work. Unfortunately, the angles are a little bit out, and, and RJ, you know, is not used to leaping around celestial space. And the spin that they cause from some of the asteroids they're leaping off throws them off balance, and you crunch into the side of the asteroid close enough to the doors that you it, it, it was only that last few feet where you're like, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it, I'm not going to make it. Crunch. Ow! You okay over there? Yeah! How's that papoose treating you? You beat me to it, Nox. I generally do, as we're, like, zipping towards the... Hey, look, slow and steady wins the race. It's not about getting there first. Yeah, these these rookie hotshots. Oh, sorry, Rook. <laughs> Different spelling, you're fine. Did I take any damage? It's going to be two damage from the impact of slamming into the boulder face for papoose first, I imagine. But you do manage to hold on to all of your hacking stuff, at least, so... Well, no, that's attached to me. <laughs> so now we've tested to see if the rocks are actually enemies, and they're not, so that's good. Just don't do it with your face next time. Yeah, if the papoose was on the back, wouldn't have been it. <laughs> RJ just digs its claws into the rock and climbs over, pulls itself. It's like walking with mag boots, but with claws. So yeah, Rook is just slowly making his way through. Well, not slow. He actually passed his mobility check, but he's just not rushing to get to the entrance. We're being tactical and stealthy, and the other two just kind of zipped over there and... Yeah. I didn't zip. I crashed. Uh, you zipped. You crashed quickly. <laughs> <laughs> you galloped? You slept? You... <laughs> Does a tiny wolf thing gallop? I think it was leaping. I think it was doing, like, uh, bouldering. Oh, well, I mean, you're also a lumberjack. Did you lumber that way? Oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, not the jokes. I mean, I thought I was bad with jokes, but your jokes, oh, <laughs> gosh. Well, we always we always spar like this, mentally, physically. We, we always spar. Yes, uh, that's fair. <laughs> that is fair. <laughs> There's a lot of ribbing involved. Mm-hmm. So, Faye, hey, uh, when we finally catch up, and uh, you're not blasted to bits because you went ahead of everyone. Um, give me a moment before you run off again so that I can try to uh, recharge your reactor because you did have a backfire back there and uh, I'd like to see if I can help you out before we get into something you might need that for. Yeah, I noticed that was... Uh, I blame Terran Tech. Oh, absolutely, it's Terran Tech. <laughs> if anything that goes wrong is going to be because of the Terran Tech because this is just terrible. It's taking some getting used to. Terranable. I, you, I, oh, Nox. Yes. Nox is just smiling. <laughs> you just see his head just shaking. The inside of the airlock is fairly sizable. It looks like it was big enough for some smaller supply ships to dock in this place. So possibly your mecha could have gotten this far in, if you can kind of picture that it's it's not a, a huge gigantic hangar but it is big enough that a small kind of supply ship could dock and unload here and that is what presumably has been happening in the past because you can see still bolted into the frames of the walls where supply crates and the like would normally have been it is as i say pitch black in here all of the internal lights in the airlock are gone the doors are open, but it doesn't look like they've been automatically opened. It looks like they're, they've been manually opened. Hmm. The kind of the hand crank to turn them is exposed, and the panelling that that normally lives behind has been torn, well, has been torn off the wall and presumably vented when all the air in here vented. I get a bad feeling about this. Mm-hmm. 
they're open reasonably wide as well. And ordinarily, again, kind of, you are experienced veterans. If you're going to manually open an airlock, there's a limit to how wide you need to open that for most things to get out. And there's a limit to how wide you can open that without some form of mag boot support or similar yourself to stop yourself getting voided once it gets to a certain thing. These have been opened almost all of the way. The internal airlock doors are still very sealed. And the stab lights from your exosuits are showing that there is carbon scoring on these doors where energy weapons have been discharged. We're not the first ones who have been uh, coming in to look for this stuff. Which means it's worth it. Let's get in there, see what they've done with it, if nothing else. Rook is going to move over to Faye, and I, we've never done this in the last game, so let's talk about the reactor charge thing. I think I'm supposed to roll my reactor die, and that bumps theirs up by one step, so it puts them back to max, but if I obviously roll bad on my reactor die, then mine drops Then yours goes down. Yes, I believe so. Faye, what's it look like for your reactor? What's it look like again? So it is like a backpack. Or like a, It's a big cylinder kind of across their shoulder blades. Okay. Uh, sealed with kind of like a silver white metal mm-hmm. with uh, uh, hexagon shaped vent holes with a light blue light emanating through it. Okay, got you. All right, so I'm going to assume that recharging the reactor is more like strengthening the magnetic field that goes around the the core itself. That's what actually weakens and therefore causes your reactor to be weaker as it goes, and then that's where you have problems. So I'm going to assume that he like basically takes his hand uh, from the mecha hand exosuit and like puts it over it, and then you kind of see it you know, pulsing with some energy or whatever. And that's what he's attempting to do is like rebolster that before we move on. So, so the way that ability works, then it automatically upgrades Simon's reactor die. It just works. And then you roll yours to see whether or not you've accidentally drained yours, jumpstarting it. That makes sense. And I rolled an eight. So you're fine. Eight. Imagine rolling high in your reactor dice. I know, I said, what? <laughs> what? I... <laughs> Look, somebody's got to do it around here. You're, you, you... <laughs> There you go. Much appreciated. Thank you. The amber lights return to a reassuring green. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, you are in the airlock. Most of the other stuff that you would expect to see in here, as I say, appears to have been voided. Mm-hmm. You also know enough about this sort of tech, especially you, Sammy, being Aeonic Primacy. You know that the internal airlocks will not disengage while the external ones are open. The only way you could get them both to open at the same time is to blow them up. But, you know, the crank to close your the external letter lock doors are is is right there it's exposed it's visible does it look damaged no not so much there is some damage around where the plate the, the you know that the sheeting that normally covers it was where it looks like that has just been torn straight off the wall by something again possibly a mech hand possibly a high-end primacy combat cyborg there is the indentation that looks like a hand of some form slightly larger than standard human hand has punched in above and kind of ripped it down. You can see the kind of the, the almost like the finger dints above it. Hmm. So Knox doesn't trust the uh, crank personally. So you see her kind of maneuver herself to one side of the two doors and tries to use her grappler to grab the door and pull it shut that way without having to touch the crank. You launch your grapplers out and they grip into the external doors and start trying to close them. It is very, very slow going, and you can start to see the, you know, the 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 engine, your reactor, starting to redline as it's trying to exert almost like an anti-lever force. But they are starting to to close. The crank starts moving like automatically because it's on. You know that that's that's how it works effectively. RJ can go over and start turning the crank, helping. I was just being cautious. Thank you for the help. I rolled a five on my reactor die to use that ability, so I'm good. Cool, cool, cool. Certainly no no traps or anything trigger, no alarms go off. And with RJ's help as well, you manage to seal the external airlock doors. Now it's really dark. <laughs> yeah, now it is completely dark. The only lights coming through are from your stab lights. <sighs> hey, Faye. Uh, so, obviously this is a normal operating procedure, but... Uh, what in the world would have happened? Have you ever seen anything like this as far as, like, from your records? Nothing like this. Um, there's supposed to be emergency lighting 
it's the primacy standard of uh, backups for backups for backups. Mm. Whatever happened here, it was catastrophically bad. Mm. Lucas, you think you can get that door open on the inside now that we're pressurizing? I don't think we're pressurizing, but we won't blow out the entire station by opening the doors. It depends on whether there's a network to connect to. You boot up your Wi-Fi, and at the moment, there is no signal to connect to. Again, because Lucas is is a professional hacker and has an array of useful systems built into like the hacking suite, there is no significant electrical current around here either. It looks like the reactors that power the reactors that power the backup reactors are all offline presently. There's no signals at all looking at the, the circuitry as you kind of plug in to see if you can, you know, manually jack it. You could possibly jumpstart it with, with your reactor to kind of put enough power into the system to make the doors open, or there is once again another internal crank. But yeah, all the, the energy systems of this place are off. It doesn't look like they've been fried, you know, because again, you, you have a, an array, a, a sensor array that lets you look at this sort of stuff. It doesn't look like there's been a big surge that's fried everything out and, and burned it out. It looks like they've either been turned off or else something has happened to the generator that's not then caused a power surge through the full system. But yeah, at the moment, there is absolutely no power, no signal, nothing for you to hack into just yet. So there's a crank on this side or that side? On this side. On this side. Well, we'll just turn the crank. Yeah, first up should be getting the power back. As RJ starts turning the crank, there is this sudden influx of pressure as the atmosphere in the asteroid base rushes into the void of the airlock where you are. You all kind of get buffeted around a little bit. Nope, nope, nope. Ah. Easy, easy, easy. <laughs> it stabilises relatively quickly. Your sensors, again, are picking up some odd contaminants in the air. I mean, you, you don't, you know, you're not smelling because that would be a very foolish thing to do. But again, it has like life support sensors and there are some odd contaminants in the air that your systems can't identify. Odd compounds. Are they biological? Yes. Yeah. I like that. Imagine having biology. <laughs> <laughs> RJ resents that comment. <laughs> Void Jr. takes point. You mean Voidling? <laughs> That's smart, Rogue. I'm surprised. And and she makes her way into the hallway. <laughs> the corridors are a little cramped for your mecha, uh, for your, your mini mechs. Certainly, there is no way your full mecha could have gotten in here. They could probably have gotten into the airlock if they hunched down a little bit, but there's no way they could have gotten deeper into yeah. the facility itself. And moving your way in, again, your stab lights, the corridors are strange in that they don't appear to follow a sensible schema. What it mostly looks like is, as the asteroid's been mined out, the trails of the ore, as that's gone through the asteroid and then been emptied, those trails have then been widened out into full-blown corridors, rather than, you know, they have tunnelled in, then they have tunnelled out, then they've tunnelled up, then they've made rooms. Like, it doesn't have that form of structure in here. They have followed the hollows that were left by the mining. So, yeah, the corridors are a little bit narrower than certainly... Faye is used to with primacy standards. This is, will not meet your ISO certified standard blueprint schematics of this place. And they kind of go up and down and curl around on themselves a little bit more. And it, it, it's a little disorienting, especially in the pitch darkness. The corridors all have steel plates along the floor and have a run of steel plates down the center and down the roof of each thing allowing people to effectively mag clip onto the sides in case there's a problem with the gravity. There are running lights, again, kind of along the, the ceiling and along the floor. They are currently not working. There have been junction boxes and that sort of, and like network boxes and that sort of patched on tech, screwed and mounted into the walls at various points with cabling running through and out. And again, Faye, this feels a lot more like the ramshackle job that you expect from the Terran Collective than the precision engineering and streamlined lines that you would expect from the Aeonic Primacy. Like this, mm -hmm. this looks like it's been put together by scrappers. Have the Primacy ever been corrupted before? I mean, I'm here. Well, I mean, you're you're corrupted in their eyes, but we think you're better. Have they ever gotten worse? Like, uh, like when a computer virus gets into a computer and like messes it up and makes it wacky. Yeah. Do you, do, do primals get do, get wacky? I've been cut off from the 
main hub, so I don't have access to full records, but there's nothing I can recall with what I got. Um, Nox is going to try to just follow those cables and any markings you might see on the wall towards the generator room, if no one uh, argues. Yeah. Oh, that's the best plan. Nope, yep, that makes sense to me. Nope, makes perfect sense to me. You've traveled in and down a little bit. There have been two side rooms that you've passed and looking into here. The closest one, which is not too far away from the door that you came in, is clearly like a life support suit storage. You know, it's where the space suits are for the people that have to go outside and paint Red Dwarf on the side of Red Dwarf, that kind of thing, you know, for external excursions. And most of those suits are still there. Some are missing, but most of them are still there. The other room is a canteen of sorts and a storeroom where, again, it looks like they drag down some of the larger boxes from the docking bay to then break them down to where they need to be. Those two rooms are a lot more what you expect from Aeonic Primacy architecture. They are a lot cleaner. They've been hollowed out. You're following the cabling down a bit further, and the tunnel you're in kind of corkscrews on itself a little bit and then drops down and kind of moves in. in an, you almost have to go kind of sideways up the wall and round Hmm. Just because, again, it's it's this place has been designed with limited gravity in mind. Hmm. As you're making your way around that side, you come across another sign that something is not right here, and that is a spray of blood up across one of the walls. Ooh. Hmm. Definitely a fight. Or a massacre. There's a little bit more carbon scoring around here, and there are odd marks in the blood spray. What do you mean, odd marks? Precisely that. Can I make a combat check to understand that? Or is that something you can do? Yeah. Make me a... I think because you're recalling from your, your human squishy brain. Make me a presence test, but if you've got combat, add two to whatever your presence score normally is. Yes, yeah, yeah. So my presence is normally a nine. That would make that an 11 because I do have combat. So, yeah, I'm trying to understand the war that or whatever happened around here. So under 11, let's see if I can do it. I want to know war. Really? Really? That was a 12. (laughs) You know enough that the marks that are in this blood have not been made by someone running through it, by someone bouncing off it, by, Mm. you know, there's no fingerprints on it. Okay. It feels like maybe like an animal has run through snow and kind of left prints behind, but it's not any prints that you're familiar with there's odd scratches with it, but it's not made by any weapon you're familiar with either. RJ. Points to the scratches. RJ. Guys, like... Oh, you're just, you just... You think it was a kaiju? I think it might have been a lot of kaiju. Why? Okay, look. There's blood splatters. There's scratches. I mean, I can't figure this out for the most part, but I mean, there are scratches, and it looks like something's ran through it. Like, look, it's, it's like when RJ tracks in... You know, from outside, you know, when they're in the mud. Do other kaijus have the ability to make many versions of themselves? The Church of the Kaiju accepts many worshippers. Yeah, it's a. It's, ah! it's, it's, it's a there's, an, there's no kind of codified type of kaiju. Every one of them is in some way unique, and they range in sizes as well. RJ is probably the smallest one that you've seen because they're not a common thing, kaiju. They are very, very rare. Razor is the only one in the Terran Dominion. Okay. These might just be some critters that they shipped here for some reason or got caught on some kind of transport. That's fair. I don't want to think too bad about this, but I mean, carbon scoring and and blood and something got out or something, it seems like. They could be just monsters, not necessarily kaiju, because kaiju are specifically very big. Uh, That's fair, except for yours. Usually. Yeah. Well, this is RJ. RJ's special. (laughs) RJ is special. Which is over. Scratch, 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 scratch. Personally, I would have just loved to wait until our mechs were built, and then I would have just cracked this thing open like a tin can up top. But right here we are. Let's just be careful as we progress, yeah? Yeah. Yep. Watch our six. All right. I'm going to pull out my hammer just because. Yeah, just maybe not the shield and power that up, but definitely the hammer. Just <laughs> this is very unnerving for poor Brooke. <laughs> And yeah, the, the gravity in here is very, very limited. It seems like that some form of artificial gravity is the only thing that is still being maintained here. Mm-hmm. Because there shouldn't be. It's normally, it is it is a powered thing, the same as all the lights. And this asteroid is not big enough to have its own gravity. But there is some gravity here. Mm-hmm. 
uh, the gravity shifts where the floor is oriented as well. Hmm. Okay, so we get used to that. But nothing is being picked up on your senses as to what is generating this gravity. It is just that there is and there shouldn't be. Oh, there shouldn't be. So this no, isn't like... Be. Oh, okay. I mean, there should be, if this place is, is powered up mm. and working, there will be some form of artigrav, but it's not. So it's not generating it, so there shouldn't be any. But there is. There's enough that you walk rather than float. Hmm. Something weird's going on. Percy Tech's so good, we get gravity without power. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm calling BS on that one. I mean, if we find out that's the case, then sure, but... You haven't heard of residual gravity before? Come on, Rook. And yes, but this is not a celestial body that's big enough to generate its own gravity like this. I was giving you crap. <laughs> yeah, well, if you won't believe me about Permissi Tech, it could just be centrifugal force. But but it's following it's following the floor, and the floor is moving in different spots. It's that that's the part that's weirding me out about that's this. That's not even a force. Yeah, because if it was if it was centrifugal force, then we'd be pushed to the outsides, and we'd be walking yeah. along the outsides at all times. But we're not. Well, only one way to find out. Anyways, where's this cable go? Yeah. <laughs> points at the cable that way <laughs> oh look you know your directions good job you follow the cable round it hooks down and you get to a point where the corridor splits it carries on further onwards which then you can see kind of looping down it kind of curves down presumably towards the center of the the asteroid where it splits which is where the cables follow goes directly to relative left from where you're standing and then after a short juncture relative up from where you're looking, but the gravity follows it, so you're still walking along the floor, even though you're actually walking at 90 degrees upwards to where you first saw it going. And that leads into a fairly sized room. There is a generator in here uh, that your stab lights pick up. There are other banks of machinery in here, maybe some life support systems, maybe some or the power junctures, maybe some gravity systems. It's not the full power plant for the asteroid, but it's one of the adjuncts to that to keep things going. The generator has been badly damaged, and you can see a crowbar still sticking out the top. There is a hand on the crowbar. <laughs> Let me guess there's not a body on the hand. There's not a body on the hand. What kind of hand is it? <laughs> It is a mech, well, a, a robotic hand, a cybernetic prosthesis, which appears to have been torn off just below the wrist, kind of maybe two inches down past the wrist, and it has been torn. You can see where the cabling from inside are hanging, where the artificial muscle fibres have been ruptured. There is a spatter of hydraulic fluid and the, the slightly charged hydrostatic electrogel that is in a lot of advanced aeonic primacy prostheses which is what makes them work that has kind of sprayed up against the wall there is no other bodies here but through the the spray of fluid you can see where uh, there is an air vent style thing to help with the first circulation of the air here that's been kind of pushed inwards and there is the fluid kind of leaking into there and that is a jar it looks like a lot of the screws that would normally hold in place have been ruptured from the inside Something was in the vents. The generator does not seem damaged beyond repair. I'm a little bit concerned that it looks like an Aeonic Primacy Bionic destroyed our own, I suppose their own. If the power needed to be turned off for any reason, you just flick the switch. Destroying it is excessive. Maybe they didn't have enough time to get to the button. Maybe the monster was feeding off of the engines, so they wanted to destroy them so that the monster would stop. Hmm. Where's the vents? Like, can we reach them from where we're at? Or do we have to climb to go, like, look at that? You can climb to to get to them. You may want to try to get the power on while I uh, take a look at that. Well, I say you look at that before we turn it on, if you're going to climb on it. Yeah, okay, that's fair. They destroyed the generator for a... They tried to destroy the generator for a reason. We should probably figure out what that reason is first. Yeah. Do we leave it off and just go under stab lights. That would still give us the element of surprise if we come across something. This is your territory there, Faye, so... I mean, it... Uh, this is a primacy facility, but this is 
far outside the norm. Well, let's get you up there, Rook. Uh, like, kind of grab you a little bit and start ushering you up the side of it <laughs> so you can look at the vents really quick. Yeah, you, you pop your blocky mech head up through the vents. The vents are small. These are not your traditional kind of horror movie trope vents where you can easily get a person through stuck. them. Stuck. Yeah, stuck. No, these are what you would expect normal air vents to be. Mm-hmm. The opening is quite big so that it can get a lot of air going in, but the actual vents themselves are maybe six inches across by six inches, kind of. Fit your head inside, but that's about it. But that's about it, yeah. There are lots, though, as you're kind of looking in, uh, you can see where, again, the hydrostatic fluid has been pulled in. There are lots of scrapes along these vents, as if something has been dragged through it, something metallic has been dragged and scratched along it. And there are also more of those odd marks that now you're you're kind of right up close to them. They look like claw marks or similar. Something has been dragging itself along with sharp protuberances. Okay, so a lot of scrapes in here. Something definitely has dragged itself through this area. I don't know what it is, but it, it's definitely making a lot of scrapes and gashes and, and things. So, yeah, something tried to come through here, obviously, and I guess it did. And then, well, that's unfortunate, but that's still, this is really unnerving, to say the least. <sighs> And we didn't see anything on the way in. I, I know there was a silhouette of, like, a body when we were coming through, but we didn't stop to see what the body was. Um, but that wasn't odd, you know? It wasn't like... And then we had the blood splatter on the wall with the tracks through it, probably similar to these. Yep, and then we have the hand ripped off. There's a monster in the walls. Uh, hopefully it's not still here. Oh, I'm almost certain that it's still here, gang. Oh, yeah, so- well, yeah, yeah. Okay, fine. So the question is now, do we turn the power back on to get its attention and bring it to us, or do we try to hunt this thing down in the dark? Because we still need to get to those data banks to get what we need, what we came here for. We'll have to turn on the power for the data banks for sure. We could always come back here right now. We still have that option. So perhaps we should investigate first, and then we can double back if we need to. Make a plan, then go loud if we need to when we get the power back on. Yeah. So consider... Prepare the generator and set up a remote power on switch. Mm. Go to the databanks, flick on the power, grab what we need, and bail before whatever is in the walls uh, can find us. Try to eat us. Do you think we have range for that? I think that's not a bad idea. Yeah, because you're not wrong. We technically don't have to kill whatever is here. We just need to get what we need and get out. Yeah. All right. I like that plan. Being Aeonic Primacy, would I have some idea of the staffing levels a facility like this would have? You would probably have three or four low-level janitorial assigned staff whose job it would be to make the rudimentary repairs, keep things ticking over, work on the meals and that sort of thing. They would probably be very low-level augments working off debts to higher members of the Primacy, effectively. Mm Mm-hmm. They are not eligible for the high-level augments that that you get for like your cast or the scientist cast or, or soldier cast. They are a menial grade. So yeah, probably about three or four for a facility of this size to keep things going there. There would be anything up to ten science core members here, depending on exactly what they're researching. Because it's not a huge facility, but Primacy are quite good at working with each other in close proximity. Their computer systems don't require an awful lot of space because they can just plug in and do a lot of the the calculations with their own built-in implants. So they probably have a few rooms that would be dedicated for storage and for keeping notes and for displays and presentations. So yeah, maybe about 10 science grade, maybe, and probably about a further four combat grade, most likely very heavily augmented, whose duties it would be to keep this place safe and secure. So Lucas, let's get you on that there reactor. Get it tootled up, and we'll plug a switch into it. Do we want to do some scouting ahead while we work on that? Rook? I think that's probably a good idea. 
at this point. I mean, we've got to get moving. We've got to get this figured out. I'd rather figure it out before it figures us or here, so to speak. Yeah. We're doing a buddy system. Faye, you stay with Lucas. Keep an eye on them. Rook and I are going to split up and go investigate further in the facility. Keep in comms. Holler Valkyrie if we need it. Sound good? 10-4. Sounds good. That sounds good. All right. I'm going to keep the camera at the moment with uh, Nox and Rook as you head down the corridor. Mostly because, Lucas, this is not a difficult task. It's not one I'm going to need to make you to roll for, for example. But it is one that's going to take you a little bit of time as you dig out repairs, really, and rewire around the damaged bits. And it is probably for the best that Faye is staying with you, largely because Faye knows knows how their wiring works. Yeah, knows the system. So the two of you start working on this. Nox and Rook, you head out down this corridor. Again, the gravity is throwing you because you effectively walk down and and flip 90 degrees onto what is now your floor and further in, uh, following along. And this tunnel that you're following, which is the main tunnel, it's the only real tunnel you've found, continues to kind of corkscrew a little bit in on itself before it opens up to a shaft that is clearly, or at least you reckon, is probably in the center of the asteroid itself. And the shaft runs up and down, and then there's a a narrow bridge that leads over to another corridor opposite, and there is a curving staircase that leads down. There is not a curving staircase that leads up. Hmm. Are there handrails on any of these? There are handrails. They are better than the Empire at basic health and safety. (laughs) (laughs) It is, again, so dark here, and your stab lights are hitting some weird diffusion effect. There's some particulate matter in the air that means that they're not going as far as they should be, and you can see like the dust gently dancing in the beam of your lights. As you've gotten to this far, which is only maybe a 10 minute walk further in, it's hard to gauge distance, because again, the way the gravity is moving things around, then you end up almost going a bit Mobius. Like, there's one point where you're walking on what for you is the floor, but is actually probably objectively the ceiling, and it is the underside of one of the corridors that you were just on. Because, again, the gravity is very, very strange here. Mm -hmm. You're starting to pick up odd signals on your comms as well. There are echoes here that are bouncing off. It does not feel like normal radio signals that you get from when you're calming each other or when you're calming from Valkyrie. There's just odd bits of static every now and then that are coming through. Yes. Does it feel like... Okay, so we're used to celestial bodies like pulsars. They rotate and obviously blast out, you know, the signals. Is it on a regular frequency of time or is it just every once in a while it kind of comes in and goes away? Every once in a while. Every once in a while. And your comm systems have identified it as communications, which is why they're trying to translate it. Uh But it is not any form of communication which they are familiar with. So it starts trying to patch it through Mm -hmm. and then crashes and then has to have a second to kind of reboot itself. That's annoying. This is not good. This is, this is that, that's not good. And as your kind of, your stab lights are looking up and down the shaft, seeing what is going on, there are signs here for the first time labelled in the primacy tongue. They use their own series of, not hieroglyphs, cantoglyphs, pictoglyphs, which you're not hugely familiar with not being from the science core, but you are clearly aware that these are, these are internal direction signs saying go here for this and go here for that. Mm. As you're kind of looking up and down, just as Lucas and Faye give you the all clear that they're ready to turn the generators on whenever you need them to, your lights pick up something moving towards you. Or should I say some things? Many, many small chitinous things that your stab lights glitter off. They're moving very, very quickly towards you from across the bridge. Nox. Yes, Rook? That's a problem. And as you say that, (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to end the episode for today.
Force Majeure is played using the Star Wars Force and Destiny game system by Edge Studios. Our intro music is by the amazing Sly Fox Audio. Check out more of her work at soundcloud.com slash slyfoxaudio. Our outro music is Suburban Outlaw instrumental version by Forget the Whale, used with gratitude under a Creative Commons license. Many of the sound effects and soundscapes are created using Sirenscape, because epic games need epic sounds. If you're enjoying the show and want to support us, there's three ways you can do that. The first is by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash force majeure pod, where for as little as $1 a month, you get access to outtakes, adverts, various other stuff, and my fortnightly ramblings. You can drop us a coffee at ko-fi.com slash force majeure pod, or you can leave us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to interact with us, there's a few ways you can do that. We are on the social medias, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter as at Force Majeure Pod. And we're over on Mastodon as at Force Majeure Pod at Dice.camp. You can also join our Discord, link in the show notes. Thank you very much for listening and being with us as we tell these stories. We hope you are having fun and we will see you next time. <laughs>